And would you open your Bibles, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm in a series that's several weeks long. This series is entitled, The Biggest Bible Truth That Changed My Life. Uh, and I've never taught this before, uh, and I decided to, uh, several months ago to share with you the Bible truths, Bible revelations, the Bible uh, information and truths that had a huge impact in my life. I mean, there are many, many more Bible truths that I've learned and many that you have learned, but I'm sharing with you the major ones that actually my life is going one way, and because of it, it is greatly affected, and everything is different from that day forward. Everything is different. Because of these simple truths that were enlightened in my heart, my life was changed, never to be the same. And because they had that level of impact in my life, I thought they'd be, it'd be interesting to share with you and to encourage you, to remind you, or to share with you a truth that you didn't know. And I pray and believe it will have a major impact in your life. That your life will be impacted in a, in a fabulous, wonderful, big, gigantic way. But first of all, I'd like to share a couple of testimonies. Uh, again, as I said, that we're getting testimonies now every week of prayers being answered, people being healed, stuff going on. We have a testimony of a, of a man that doesn't even go to our church who is facing cancer and people in our church began praying for him and took him on as an assignment and God has now touched his life and he's free of cancer, which I think is pretty powerful. But one thing I'm really happy about and, I, and, and so are some of the people we have, uh, I, we've received this last week, where we've had three people get jobs through prayer. Actually, actually, there, there are four people who have gotten jobs. Two people are outside the church. Two people are inside the church. But our prayer team was involved in praying for you. The church was involved because you're putting them on the connection cards. You're putting them on that prayer request cards. We know what your needs are. Now we're able to pray. And our team gets out there. They start praying and they don't give up until it's done. And that's important. You are not alone in this life. You have a family that's with you, a spiritual family, a church family that's right there with you. And as you communicate with us, we're able to surround you with prayer. And we've got people who can pray. I also have a prayer request for somebody who didn't get a job, but they're just glad that their resume is getting out and that they feel encouraged in the Lord that things are happening. And that is also very important because without hope, there's nothing that your faith can attach itself to. Without hope, you start to shrivel and you start dying on the inside. God wants to make sure that you know that you are not alone, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. So I think those are some really, really great uh, encouraged truths um, or uh, testimonies. Now, let's go to our Bible truths. Here's the ones that we've talked about thus far. The Bible truths that have changed my life. The first one is God's will. Or excuse me, God's word is alive, powerful, and we order our lives by it. That's, I, I spent one whole Sunday morning talking to you about that and how important the word of God is. And once you realize the word of God is alive, you will be, you will be empowered and you will have faith to trust it and to rely on what God has said. The second truth that I shared with last week is the one that everybody loves is the tithe belongs to God. And I did have some people who were here for the very first time last week. I had um, one, one person share with me afterwards. It was their first Sunday, but they still enjoyed the money talk. <laughs> That's not how they put it. They, they still enjoyed the, the sharing the, 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 the word. Because when I found out that the tithe belongs to God, it changed, it changed the course of my life completely. Absolutely completely. And I made a commitment to God that I've never gone back on ever and I committed, made that commitment at the age of 21 and through all kinds of financial difficulties, financial good times, financial hard times, but never gave up because I looked to God because what is more important than making sure that we honor him with all of our first fruits of our increase, the first fruits of our labors, and just to keep God first. One reason I would never, ever, ever, ever stop tithing is because I found a spiritual revelation, a truth from the Bible that says my heart is connected to it. And I found out that if I continued to honor God financially, it was easier to honor him other areas of my life. He just starts elevating and going higher. So today I want to talk to you not about the third truth, which is next week. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about truth number three, which is actually the biggest one. If I put him in order of importance, next week's would be first. 
but I have them in order of how they came into my life. And so I didn't know. I wish someone had brought next week's truth into my life at the first part of my spiritual journey, but that's not how it happened for me. But today I want to do part two on tithing. But I want to talk to you about something a little bit different. I want to talk to you about beyond the tithe. Today I want to talk to you about what I call God loves a generous heart. Oh, I want to talk to you about just generosity. I just want to talk to you about the spirit of generosity, the spirit of being a generous person, just the spirit of being kind and generous and how God loves that. I, co I connect it to the tithe belongs to God. Before I do that, I want to give you an update on a couple of things. I had several questions, several emails came in this last week about last, last Sunday's message, which I thought were awesome. I thought they were great questions. I answered them in email, but I said I would like to address them publicly as well without naming the person or the situation. I'm going to, you know, give it in a general question format so I don't identify anybody because I wouldn't want to embarrass anyone that's asking a question of unless they're saying, you may use my name. I wouldn't. Anyway, let me first give you an update on the lottery winner I told you about. Okay. I happened this, um, the very, I told you about last week, lottery. I happened to play golf the next day with, the, with that pastor. And so I was asking about it and I got some updates. So I need to correct the story a little bit. He came to me and he said, and he was telling, he was telling me uh, a lot more information about what's happened. And so this is what's take place. This is a friend of mine, for those who don't know. He pastors in Southern California. And he's not local. It's not even in Orange County. Um, but someone in his congregation won the lottery a couple months ago. California lottery. $185 million. After taxes. After taxes. He took the cash. The cash. He walked away after obligation to Uncle Sam with $85 million. $85 million. He said on TV that when they asked him about, and I also found this, I, I'm, I've been told that California has a non -dis, or a, a disclosure clause or something, a law that if you win the lottery, you have to disclose yourself. So in case that happens, come to me right away anyway. I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> but here's, here's what took, the man said on TV, what, they, they asked him a question, what do you do with all the money? He goes, I don't know yet, but the first thing I'm going to do is give the church a lot of money he said. And so my pastor saw that on TV, my pastor friend. He saw that on TV. Man hasn't given any money yet to the church, but it, it hasn't given any yet. Found out he's not a tither. And this is a great lesson. I found out that he's a consistent giver. What it, the bookkeeper told the pastor, he goes, ever since he won the lottery, he doubled his giving. He went from $25 a week to 50 How many times have you heard someone say this statement? When I make more money, I will start tithing. It doesn't happen. Here's a person who didn't tithe, who came into $85 million and hasn't given any more than 25 extra dollars a week to the church. And then, what he, and then he had a meeting with the pastor and said he's going to, oh, what he did do before he actually got the check he went out and bought a $5 million home, and then he bought the 85 acres behind the home. Wherever your money is, there's your heart. Wherever your heart is, there's your treasure. Wherever your treasure is, there's your heart. It doesn't matter which way you look at it. You can see where the, where the heart is. So the man, now the man said this, that he's going to give the church a $500,000 check. But his tax advisor told him, don't do it this year. Do it January 1st because you've already paid all those taxes and it won't do you any good. So now, now we have Uncle Sam through the IRS and the regulations of the IRS dictating when you should give to the church. Here's what I'm saying is we're missing the point. We're missing the point. And as soon as he told me that he wasn't a tither, I understood all this guy's behavior. And I told my pastor friend, thank God you're getting the 500000 on January 1st, which, you know, really won't happen until the second, third, or fourth, first Sunday in January or something. What would happen if the IRS told you that you cannot deduct your giving? It was not tax deductible. It's coming. It's coming. 
Soon the government will tell you that you will not be able to deduct from your taxes your contributions to nonprofit organizations. Will that change your tithe to the church? If it does, you have a heart problem. You have a real problem. If you're doing it for tax reasons, then your tax benefit is all that you rip, reaped from it. Thank God you get a tax benefit from it. I think it's great, but that's not the motive behind it. That isn't the motive. Not at all. So th then, then I got this question. Somebody emailed me um, and asked about if, because I talked about the lottery, if I was promoting gambling and that if children, Christians should gamble and that they thought I was saying that gambling is okay. My response, and, and I'd like to share, is in the Bible, I can't find anywhere in the Bible where gambling is a sin. Gambling is a recreation. Gambling is something that somebody does for entertainment. But if a person gambles their rent money, their mortgage money, their food, their utility money in a hope that they're going to get more money, you have jeopardized the welfare of your family, now you're sinning. If you are addicted to gambling and you continue to gamble, now you're sinning. So the Bible talks about that all things are okay, but not all things are expedient. You know, there are certain situations that you shouldn't. There are movies I've gone to that were a gamble. <laughs> and I walked out thinking I lost. And I, there are some movies I have walked out thinking I paid, you know, 15 bucks for that? When I could wait a few more months for $1.50 at Redbox? So I grade things on whether they're Redbox worthy. <laughs> anyway, back, back to gambling. If gambling is an issue, if gambling is depleting you of money, then you, it's a sin for you. If it's an entertainment, a form of entertainment, like going to the movies or doing something else, and you do it for, for fun, it's, you know, it's, now there are laws in California that you're not allowed to gamble certain things in certain ways, stuff like that. You can't gamble, but you can buy a lottery ticket. You know, go figure that. Anyway, um, the other question I had that came in, which I thought was an excellent question, was someone says that currently, um, some, no, I'm going to reword this. If you get money that is a gift for a purpose, do you tithe on it? Here was the question. If somebody gives you money to buy groceries for your household, or someone gives you money to help you pay your electric bill or your rent, should you tithe on it? And I said, no, you don't tithe on that. That is a gift. You don't tithe on gifts, you tithe on income. Income is based off tithing, or excuse me, based off income. If someone gave you a sweater, would you tithe on it? You know, when you are having a baby shower, do you add up all the gifts and then go tithe on it? No, those are just gifts. Those are people just loving you. Those are people just saying, I want to help. Those are people just giving you something. You know, no. So do you tithe if you win the lottery? You better. <laughs> but no, tithing's based off of, it's, it's based off of um, income. I, I have also found myself, no matter what I say up here in this pulpit, somebody's mad at me. So um, hang in there. If I haven't made you mad, I will. If I have, then there'll be another day I won't. So if we, you know, hopefully it'll balance out and, and even out. But let's talk about generosity. I want to talk to you today about the heart, having a heart of generosity, of being a generous person. And I, I read recently, got some information on a recent survey that was done in the United States. It has been proven that Americans, that the more money they make, the less percentage that they give to charitable organizations. The richer America gets, the stingier they get. It has been proven that people who are in the middle class and lower income give a higher percentage of their income to, to the church than do rich people or people who make tons and lots of money. Isn't that interesting? 
I, I thought that's very interesting. It'd be a challenge for you. As God starts blessing you, do you all of a sudden start giving less percentage? Uh, I, I've pastored for over 35 years. When I was pastor in Anaheim, I was talking about money and we we're talking about tithing and talking about things like that. So did a report, found people who were, people who were making Fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year were giving six to ten thousand dollars a year to the church. Then I could show another family who made five hundred thousand dollars and gave sixteen hundred dollars in one year to the church. Some of you think that if you make more money, you'll be more generous. Generosity does not come from how much you have. It comes from your heart. And God loves a generous heart. God loves a generous heart. He wants you to be generous. He wants you to be full of life and full of power. Look, at God is the begin. The, he's the one that starts generosity. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, the thing that I think is extremely important for you to grasp is it says that you through his poverty, his poverty, through his poverty, not through his riches, through his poverty, which is grace. In other words, Christ himself, Jesus Christ, went to the cross, paid the price for your well-being, not just spiritually, but also financially, also emotionally, also mentally, also relationally. This salvation encompasses everything that deals with life. And the Bible says that through his poverty, you might become rich. I found it also very interesting that I researched the word rich right here where you might become rich. And it says here that Jesus Christ, though he was rich, might become rich. Because some of the commentators that I was reading would say, well, this means that Jesus was spiritually rich and he became spiritually poor and that you might become spiritually rich. Well, when you look up the, the Greek word for rich in both locations, same word, it has to do with possessions, has to do with stuff, it has to do with money, it has to do with food, it has to do with what life is needed. And Jesus Christ had everything, gave it all up so you could have it. That's his will, that's his desire. He wants to bless you. Pastor, are you telling me that God's will is for everybody to be rich? I am not, that verse is. At verse is. So, Pastor, what's rich? That's a good question. We'll answer that in just a moment. Because everybody has a different uh, definition of what that means. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. When it's time to give, when it's time to share your tithe, worship the Lord with your tithes, when it's time to do that, do you, oh man, and you write the check. Or you punch in the information online. Or you use our app. Or you put cash in the offering. Is it, is it emotionally challenging to you? Because that is not what God loves. God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't want you to do it grudgingly or of necessity. He wants you to do it because you purposed in your where? and your heart. He wants you to do it because you purposed in your heart. Then it says here, I mean, I'm going to get back to the rich people. And all of you say, yeah, talk to them. <laughs> oh, hold on. Look what it says in 1 Timothy. Command those who are rich. What's it say to do? Command. So this is a letter that Paul writes to Timothy. It's called pastoral letter. And it's a letter that is given uh, that leaders in the church are getting information and guidance and direction from Paul the apostle. And Timothy is, and Timothy is told by Paul, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, 
nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. This, church, this verse is packed full of great stuff. Let me show you a couple of things. It says, to make sure, charge those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches. Don't trust in the riches. Don't think that because I have a bank account, because I have money, because I have something, now I'm going to be good. I'm going to avoid calamity in my life. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God. Trust in the living God. Trust, and I love how he puts it, the living, not the dead God. He's the living God. Trust in the living God. But here's another huge part of this verse. This God gives us richly all things to enjoy. Enjoy. God wants you to enjoy life. And the first of next year, which is only a couple of months away, sometime in January, I'm going to do a message on enjoying life. That you just enjoy life. You need to enjoy life what God has done in your life. If you're not enjoying it, he's thinking, gosh, I've done this for you. Why don't you enjoy? Enjoy life. Put a smile on your face. Enjoy what God is doing in your life. But just enjoy life. Here's what else it says. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. So we have to be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. And then the next verse, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So he's telling the rich people that you need to, to put this to practice. You need not to trust in riches, but to trust in the living God. You need to enjoy what God has given you. And you also need to be willing to work, willing to give, willing to share. And you need to be storing. This is how you store things up. So the question comes down is, rich or how much do you need to make each year to be rich in the survey that was done and the survey that I referred to they are asking Americans and Americans wide the average American says in order for you to be rich you need to make hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year if you make hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year then you are rich say that to people in Orange County and New York and San Francisco and other places, and you ask anyone who makes a household income of a hundred, collectively, household income, collectively, collectively of $150,000, and they're gonna laugh at you when you call them rich. They're gonna say, I'm not rich. But the average American thinks that you are rich. It gets worse. It gets worse. To a person who makes $35,000 a year, the survey said, what is it, how much is rich? And the person who makes $35,000 a year said, someone who makes $75,000 a year is rich. If you make $75,000 a year, you are rich. You are rich. When they asked the subscribers of Money Magazine, They, they surveyed the subscribers of Money Magazine and said, how much in liquid assets do you have to have available to you? Liquid assets, cash, liquid assets, something you could sell right away and turn it into money. How much do you have to have to be considered rich? They said $5 million. <laughs> the guy that has $5 million thinks it's $15 million. The definition is of how much do you need to have to be rich? The answer is more than you've got. Right? It's more than what you have right now. That's what the answer is. Um, well, let me, let me share with you another fact that might be shocking to you. If you make forty-four dollars to $48,000 a year in family income, you are in the 1% of the entire world. And the rest of the world thinks you're rich. If you make $44,000 to $48,000 of family income, you are in the top 1% of the world. So what is rich in a village in the middle of Africa that doesn't have running water? What is rich 
to a newly married couple renting an apartment in Orange County. It's very different, isn't it? But what I would like to talk to you about is, I don't care how much you make, if you make less than 44,000 or if you make more than 500,000 a year, it doesn't matter. What God loves is a cheerful giver. God loves a generous heart. God loves generosity. God loves people relying on him that what you do have came from him and he's got more. And this is what's really important. What's really important is, is what are we doing with what we do have? What are we doing with what we have? It says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give. Remember, I already put this on, but I wanted you to see it again. As he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful, a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. With your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I want to work our way into that Bible verse. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we have a unique chapter. And what's so unique about this chapter is Paul is writing to the people of Corinth. As you know, that's why it's called the second, the letter, uh, the second letter of Corinthians. Because Paul already wrote a first one, and that's right before the second one in the Bible. This one is, but Paul does something very, very unique. Paul is on a mission of raising money. Paul, the apostle, he is raising money to take it to Jerusalem to help people who are facing a drought in Jerusalem. And he's been raising money for over a year. He's on a campaign and going from city to city, town to town, village to village, province to province, and he's collecting money. And what happens is he is currently in Macedonia. And he's writing the letter of 2 Corinthians to the Corinthians and letting them know I'm coming to you by way of Macedonia. And guess what? I've told the Macedonians all about your generosity and your willingness to give and your heart for the hurting. And they have been moved by your testimony to give. The only problem is Paul's not sure they're going to give. Let me tell you a little bit about the Corinthians, Corinth and Macedonia. UCLA, USC. You got it? UCLA, USC. Paul is on the campus of UCLA. And he is walking around and talking about how much money USC has pledged for San Diego because they're hurting. Okay? No, we'll get to Orange County. They've all pledged the money for the church in Orange County. All right? So he's on the campus of UCLA, and he's talking, and he's bragging up USC, bragging up, bragging up, bragging up, bragging up USC, telling them all about it. And then they're all like, oh, no, they're not going to outgive us. And they've been motivated by the testimonies, by the challenge, and they start giving money on the campus of UCLA for the saints in Orange County. Paul's now a little concerned. He's actually very concerned. He's getting so much money from the people of Macedonia who are also in a very trying economic time. The unemployment rate is very high. There's not a lot going on. They've got some problems themselves with the economy and the food distribution and some other things. And Paul is raising money in a bad economy of UCLA, bragging about USC. And so what he does, he's, he's realized that these guys have really moved, been moved by the challenge, and now are given with their, and realized, and they found out, gosh, these guys are given beyond their own ability. It can only be by the grace of God. So Paul, in his concerned state and in his wisdom, he sends people with the letter, this letter, in front of him, get over to USC. Give them this letter. And it gets to USC and they're reading this. So here's what happens. Now we, we're on the campus of USC. Okay? Here's what he says. Now considering ministering to the saints, it is unnecessary for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast to you uh, of you to UCLA, Macedonians. 
that Achaia, or Achaia, which is the province of, um, Cor of the city of Corinth, and Corinth is the capital city, was ready a year ago, and your zeal was stirred up, has stirred up the majority. So he says to UCLA, USC was ready a year ago to bring the money. A Paul's a pretty good fundraiser. But look what, what Paul starts to tell everybody. Yet, verse 3, yet I have sent the brethren, lest, lest um, our boasting of you should be in vain in, the respect, in this respect, that is, I said, you may be ready. Says so the ones, I, I've sent this group of people to make sure you're ready. Because if you're not, I'm going to look really bad. Because look what he says. If some from Macedonians or UCLA come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. He's going to, well, you guys are going to make me look really bad if you're not ready to give this offering that you promised a year ago. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and to prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. And here's what Paul says. You guys at USC told me how much you're going to give. I'm now a year later on the campus of UCLA just quoting what you said. Now you better do it. You better do it. How many times have someone said in their prayer time with their bills paid, God, I'm going to tithe. And then an unexpected bill comes and the very first thing that they think that they should take the money from is their tithe and never think about their Starbucks bill. Think about it. Five bucks at Starbucks, five days a week. How much is that? $25, four weeks in the month. How much is that? hundred bucks. Hundred dollars a month, habit. But with my, what's the big tall one called? Vente? Vente. I'm holding my Vente, talking to my pastor, sharing with him, I can't tithe. Wait a minute. My phone rang. Pastor, would you hold my Vente? Pull out my iPhone 6. This, I'm not picking on you. <laughs> oh, oh, I've got to look something up. Let me, let me get my iPad out and get on Starbucks's it free internet. Okay. Okay. What we're talking about is Paul is saying generosity needs to be the forefront of our giving, not grudging, a, a grudgingly attitude or grudge attitude or, or an obligation or like, oh, gosh, I've got here it is. Here's my time. There you go. Oh. Um, verse 6. But this, I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now he's telling this to USC, who's already promised to give. And now the people at USC are hearing what UCLA is doing through this letter. And, these, and then Paul's reminding them and just says this. If you sow Sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you, if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. Verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace 
would you underline or circle or highlight, depending on the device you're using from paper to electronic, the word all. God is able to make all grace. The very fact that Paul uses the word all should indicate to all of us there is more grace than just the grace of salvation. There is the grace of life, the grace of blessing, the grace of healing, the grace of prosperity, the grace that God wants to do in your life. That God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Let me tell you what this Bible verse is not saying. This Bible verse is not saying that it is God's will for you as an individual to give money to every good work in the world. You do not have enough resources, nor does anyone on the face of the earth have enough resources to do that. That is not God's intent. That you would give to everything, everything that comes your way. But what his intent is that you would have all things, that you would have life's essentials, that you would have God's blessings in your life, and that you would have what is needed to give to the good works that are connected in your heart. What are the things that, that just resonate inside you? What is it that you want to be involved in? What is it that God's burning in your heart? What missionary, what work, what Girl Scout, Boy Scout, what Little League, whatever else it might be, but what's inside your heart that you would even have enough for them? I know some, some Christians I've never seen at work. I have watched this through the years, and this would be, definitely be on my list of the mistakes, the biggest mistakes I've watched Christians make. And that is to divide the tithe. That is, I'm going to take my tithe and I'm going to give it here and I'm going to give it there and I'm going to give it there. I'm going to give it here. I'm going to give it here. The reason God said to bring it to your storehouse, which is your local church, whatever place that you are worshiping, that place that you've connected and it's called home. The reason is, is because he wants you to have no control of it. He, he wants you to offer it. He wants it to be an offering. He wants you to give it where you are now holding on and saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some over here and I'm going to give some over here. I'm going to give some. There's no place in the Bible that says that we're supposed to do that. There's no place that indicates that we're supposed to um, divide it up. But what it does say right here, according to this verse, that there would be enough grace that if I have it in my heart to give to this organization because I have a passion for this organization and I want to see this organization do something that I would even have for that. I will have something for them that God would give me the grace to give my tithe and to give to this. Which means, Pastor, are you saying we've got to give more than our tithe? Absolutely. I believe that the tithe is the beginning of where we all start and that we're supposed to move up to that. I had a testimony from a year ago, someone in our church who said they felt challenged by God to take their tithe from 10% to 11%. They went to 11% and within 60 days got a pay raise. Within another 30 days, something else happened. And then another 30 days, something else happened. And they, they made it, they, they're tithing, and budget their life around that, and then they moved it and challenged themselves to one more percent. That was starting into, okay, now I'm moving into offerings. I'm moving into a generous heart. I'm moving beyond just what God has said that we should all be doing. I want to go beyond the all, with, with the average. I don't like being an average Christian. I want to be a good Christian. I want to be a strong believer. I want to be a disciple. And so he says here, verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, listen to this, as it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Well, we're quoting from the Old Testament, but what's so important is God himself has dispersed abroad, which means God has already planted in your future opportunity for divine seed planting. Or God has you plant seed in different ministries, in different lives, in different families, different people. God asks you to be generous. God asks you to, um, to, to touch the people who work for tips. You know, there's a lot of people who they work for tips. And I've had several of our, our children who they've had a job where they're relied on, their entire income is relied on that tip. Now, if that server's doing something well, that person is doing something well, then let's, let's acknowledge that. Let's do that. Um, 
and let's, let's make sure that that takes place, that this is their life. And let's not say, well, gee, you know, I, I can carry my own bags. The guy just needs a couple of bucks. And we come to the person on the street corner. And people have that. I remember uh, I had a men's group. We, that topic came up when it was heated discussion. It was a very heated discussion. People have very, very strong opinions about people sitting on the corner and asking for money. And I'll tell you, my policy doesn't have to be your policy. My policy is if I can give them something without getting them killed or somebody else injured, then the answer is a yes until I hear a no. And there have been times I've come up to the corner and I felt like, in my heart, no. And I don't know why. I don't have to guess. I don't know if my, my safety was involved in that. I don't know if someone else or if, if, if God just saying, no, you're not helping this person. But we should be learning to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. We should be in tune with the Holy Spirit. We should be able to hear the yes or no, that simple, that fast, that quick. Coming down the freeway off ramp, see the guy, Lord, you want me to do anything? The Lord says, no, don't. Okay, keep on going, drive. In fact, it's green light, please don't stop. Or you could hear a yes. But let's just listen. Let's just be open. Let's just think. Uh, let's just tr move into a place of generosity. And he says in verse 10, look at verse 10. Oh, I forgot to tell you what verse 9 says. He has dispersed abroad. I told you that, that God has already put into your future places that he's going to bless you because you give. Places is going to bless you because of your generosity. This entire chapter is just on generosity. Verse 10. He may, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Whoa! Paul's writing from UCLA to USC. He's going and he, and he says to you guys at USC, how many USC people in here? How many UCLA people? Okay, now please don't get in a fight after church. <laughs> okay, listen, here's what he says. He says, now telling the people at USC, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. God says that if you will sow your seed, if you will give your tithe, if you will do it with a generous heart, there will always be food to eat. There may not always be a new iPhone. There may not always be the newest Mac. There may not always be the newest Android phone. There may not always be the newest car, but there will always be food. You following me? He, has, he is not asking you to give that you may consume after your own lust without any check and balance in spiritual growth. He's asking you to give because he wants to make sure you're always eating. He wants to make sure that you are provided for. He wants to make sure that as you are generous, generosity is provided unto you. And he says, now he who supplies seed for the sower, that's you, and bread for food, that's you. So you've got both. You've got both in your purse, both in your wallet, both in your bank account. You've got both. Every single paycheck, what that paycheck is, it represents seed to sow and supply to consume. You've got both. God has given both of it to you. When we choose to give it all away, we will starve and die. When we choose to consume it all, we will dry up spiritually and we'll be challenged in other areas of life. He wants us to do both. It's right here. He would like us to move out into both areas. Verse 11. While you are enriched in everything for all liber liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. And the rest of the verse continues to say the same thing again and again and again. This, your generous heart produces thanksgiving to God. When you are at a restaurant, and, a, and the, the person serves you and you give them a generous tip. It is, and it, you, don't even have to, you don't have to give them a tip plus a track. Do we use those terms anymore, tracks? You don't have to give them a tip and a note that Jesus loves them. You can just give them a tip. You don't have to stand up in the restaurant and yell, I'm a Christian and I'm giving a big tip right now. 
You don't have to do that. But what it does in the world of the spirit and the atmosphere of the community and in this country, it puts this shield around people of there's generosity. There's generosity. There's generosity. Can I give you a couple of pointers on how to be generous? I don't know how this started, but it's almost expected nowadays. You you take an elementary school teacher, junior high school teacher. It is almost expected of them to use some of their own money to decorate their room and to supply things to their, for their room. It's almost expected to take their paycheck and put it, some stuff in their room. How about if the parents were able to cover that and that would give the teacher an immediate raise? If that teacher didn't have to spend any money on his or her classroom because all the parents took care of it, you just gave a raise to that teacher. I don't know how that came about, but I've seen a lot of teachers who are extremely generous and so sold out to their children that they'll sacrifice their own paycheck to make sure their kids have a good environment. I've seen in public and private school. And it'd be great if something could happen there. I'll give you another little thought about generosity. We've already talked about this about tipping people and just being kind to people. Um, as we go to a cashless society, as we go to a cashless society, um, more and more and more people are giving online, giving online. Well, there is a fee that hits the organization, the church or any other organization. Uh, there's a fee. In our, in our church, it, if someone uses a credit card, we have to pay a 2.65% fee. The bank gets that. Credit card processing company gets that. And they have, um, they, they take it. So what I have done, what, what Suzette and I have done, is we upped our giving by 3%. In other words, if your tithe is $100, I'm giving the church $103 because I don't want the church to lose that money. Now, that helps me to be generous. It helps me to step out. helps me to think beyond, outside the box in the sense of just thinking um, and being generous. Other ways that you can be generous is just helping people that you see a need. Generosity is not always money. Generosity is a smile. Generos- generosity is getting out of the way and opening the door for a complete stranger at the mall. Generosity is being aware that you're not the only person on planet Earth and everybody re- re- revolves around you. Generosity is being aware that there are other people and might other people be in need. It's generosity is also seeing somebody that you could tell. You, have a, you feel in your heart, you see a complete stranger at the mall or at the park or at a little league game or soccer or something complete, but you feel like, how about just walking over to them and say, I, I don't want to alarm you, but I have an impression that things may not be going all that great right now and could I pray for you? Or is there anything, you have any prayer need? There's just ways that you could say it. Generosity is an attitude of the heart, and God loves a cheerful, cheerful, cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. The cheerful giver is a generous giver. That, it comes from deep inside the heart. Let's close our Bibles, turn off our devices.